that she's going. They're, they're blue. Both of them. Yeah. She took both of them down. I freaked out the champagne. Yeah. 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 about the criminal mind. He spent almost 30 years fighting crime on Raleigh streets. In a case like this, what you have to dig deep into is the motive. Right now it's just me. He exercised the evil within him. My kids, this is they have to talk to them every night. I don't see them. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science. We're three days away from the Lifetime movie on Chris Watts. And what I think we can expect from this Lifetime movie is a dramatization based on Chris Watts's confessions. In other words, it's not going to be accurate going to be accurate to what he said but that doesn't mean it's going to be accurate um, if you look at the lifetime synopsis which was published recently on the international business times it refers to dark secrets looming just beneath the surface and the end of the article then also refers to a darkness inside of him that contributed to the crimes and so i think the question um, is worth asking what are we talking about? What is he talking about? What was Sherilyn Cadle's book talking about? When you talk about this darkness, what are we getting at? And I've already seen some people sort of saying, well, it, it wasn't one thing, it was a combination. Sure. Yes, it was a combination. His motive also wasn't one thing, it was a combination. But when we asking about this darkness, we want to know what was it more than other things. And so in this episode, we're going to go through a list of five um, aspects to this, all of which are referenced in the discovery. Um, some of them are things that have been referred to by Chris Watts. Some of them have been referred to by the media and pundits. And some of them haven't been referred to anyone except um, True Crime Rocket Science. And these are rage, evil, lust, fear, and the live character. So I hope when you listen to this episode, you will keep an open mind. I also hope you can be honest to yourself about what you think is the root of this darkness inside Chris Watts. And then by the end of the video, see if your thinking has shifted at all. Uh, think about whether it, sh it should shift, whether it needs to shift. Um, but even before we get to that point, just ask yourself, is your impression of Chris Watts, is your explanation when you, you think about what happened does it satisfy you is, is it convincing to you when you talk to others about it is it convincing are you do you feel you've got a handle on the darkness and i think this is an important question to ask going into the lifetime movie and what I hope that um, people watching this video will do is take these thoughts into the Lifetime movie. While you're watching the movie, consider those five traits. Consider whether this is about rage, evil, lust, fear, or the love character. 
which one more than the other, which one is, is almost um, totally irrelevant. And I'd be interested to know what you think, uh, as I say now, after watching this video, but also after watching the movie. So please come back after the movie and, and see if your thinking on that has changed in any way. Um, before we get to the analysis in this episode, if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please do like, share, leave a comment and let's get started. Okay, so this whole idea of the darkness inside came to me just from reading the simple International Business Tribune article, which is really providing a praise of the Lifetime movie that's coming out in a couple of days. And so I thought I would go through a couple of conventional ideas that some people have and also conventional um, theories and then um, refer to some of them, refer to some of this uh, in the discovery. So quite a simple way of establishing whether one of these concepts is as more um, substance is one can say, well, how often is it mentioned in the discovery? So in order to get the screen grabs, and, and I do recommend if you can try to watch um, parts of this, this video because it is going to refer to the discovery and then just look at the texts that you see there. And obviously, where more um, of a particular word is referenced, that's going to give you some indication that it might be a little bit more relevant than where it's not referenced at all. Not necessarily, but potentially. Okay, and so we are going to start with rage. And uh, the word rage appears in a couple of headlines, like this one from CNN. Chris Watts confessed to his father that it, he, killed his fa he killed his wife in a rage. Um, and, and this was taken from the discovery where he's kind of confessing to Ronnie Watts. It's the clip I played at the beginning of this episode. And so if we go to page 607 of the discovery, we see Chris Watts talking about the rage that I felt for what she was, what she did. It just took over. Now, I think that misspeaking is, is quite interesting. The rage that I felt for what she was. And then he says, he corrects himself, what she did. It just took over. Remember, at this point, he was... Um, fielding the scenario that Shannon had killed the children, uh, which we know wasn't true. But he was saying that the rage that he felt for what she was, and, that, and then he corrected himself. Um, he may have meant, you know, for what she was doing or for what, but I think it is quite interesting just the way that he misspoke there. And that brings us to the next one. And bear in mind when Chris Watts says, I freaked out and did the same thing to expletive her. When he's saying, I freaked out, he's using a word that can um, refer to rage or, um, you know, if you freak out, you, you're becoming emotional, right? Freak out can mean quite a few different things. It can mean being extremely surprised. It can mean confused, but it can also mean upset or angry. And, and typically it does mean getting angry. And in this sense, that's exactly what it does mean. That's also the meaning that Chris Watts seems to refer to, that he freaked out. He, he got so angry because of what Shanann had done, that he took it out on her. And so he's using the words freak freaked out to refer to his rage. And we see that in the rest of the discovery where he refers to it as just rage, right? And uh, what's interesting is um, the way Chris Watts sort of uses the same term for himself and Shanann. He says, um, Shanann lost it, 
because she knew he was cheating on her, right? So by that is is also saying that she almost went crazy with anger, crazy with rage, became incredibly hysterical, whatever. And then he uses another. Um, it's actually his father, Ronnie, who says that Shanann go off. He, he says went off, meaning also lost it. So it's all these words are saying the same thing. Freaked out, lost it, went off um, is about being upset. It's about being very, very agitated, but 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 agitated in an angry way. You know, if you find out you've been used or you find out that someone has cheated on you or you've been played or tricked or whatever, you're going to feel, probably you're going to feel anger, if not rage. And um, you might freak out, you might lose it, you might go off. And so that is what, that's the kind of emotion that Chris Watts is playing at here. Elsewhere in the discovery, it refers to going into a blind rage, you know, when he, when he realized what Shanann had done, okay, again in this fictitious scenario, he said he went into a blind rage. Elsewhere, he said he had a lot of rage. And then there's another reference from his father, Ronnie, where he says, well, he could understand how rage could come out by seeing your kids dead, right? I've said this before, I don't think rage is the operative emotion. Um, Chris Watts sort of uh, refers to, in his second confession, he sort of takes the scenario even further and he says, he just snapped. I'm quite familiar with this particular thing. It comes up quite a lot in uh, defense cases. You see it quite a lot in um, um uh, criminal murder trials, sometimes when the defendant takes the stand, anything that he does that is not really um, explicable, well, he just snapped, you know, um, but th that isn't really true. As soon as you say snapped, you want to divorce yourself from all the dynamics and you want to just sort of snap your fingers and say, well, you know, I behaved strangely there, I can't really say why. And, and that's why they, they use this explanation is so that they don't need to provide any kind of backstory. It's the same thing with the, the demon possession and the darkness, by the way. What's quite interesting is during the second confession, Chris Watts sort of explained how his attorney, John Walsh, mentioned that the crime of strangulation was passionate. And he, he does understand how that could be passionate. Now, I think Chris Watts shows his lack of actual intelligence here. Um, what his attorney probably was talking about is a crime of passion and not that the strangulation was passionate. And I think this made an impression on Chris Watson. He, he sort of thought, you know, if this is well known, you know, this, this kind of kind of passionate crime, that, then um, I'm going to talk about how, you know, something that was well known, except it wasn't really a crime of passion in a typical sense with Chris Watts. It wasn't a crime of passion um, in the sense of, you know, a couple of people at a barbecue and seeing someone cheating and, and just becoming overcome with emotion in that sense. I don't think emotion really played... Um, such a big role in this case. Um, I think Chris Watts is quite a controlled person emotionally. Um, not completely, but um, I don't think, I certainly don't think he snapped and I certainly don't think he suddenly became overwhelmed with, um, you know, feelings of um, passion. I don't think this is a crime of passion, although I think there are elements to it, certainly. But um, it's just interesting the way that Chris Watts actually describes it kind of incorrectly, not a crime of that was passionate. So th that's certainly interesting to see. And then um, in the same sort of section in the discovery, and this is from the second confession, 
it refers to there being more anger than anything else because there was no love there. He said there was more anger from him and desperation from her. I don't think that's true really either. I don't think um, that was what was really going on. I do think Shanann was quite desperate to stay married, to, to you know, be in a situation where she'd be looked after and, you know, have someone, another income to, you know, take care of her and, and, and the third child. So I think there was some desperation from her. But I also think there was desperation from him. He was desperate to um, continue his affair. He was desperate to get out of the debt burden they were in. But I don't think the as many times as rage and anger is mentioned here, I don't think it's really that relevant. I think there was a lot of simmering resentment and I think there was anger. But I don't think that's the strongest um, aspect. I don't think that's the darkness that we're talking about. And one of the reasons is you just don't see a lot of you don't see a lot of anger from either Chris Watts or Shanann on display, especially not from him. You really don't see um, nobody talks about him losing his temper anywhere ever. Um, just doesn't come up. Not even Shanann. Shanann doesn't even say Chris Watts really got angry with me. Just doesn't happen. Uh, she talks about her own anger and she talks about sh she can get angry and she's got an Italian temper. So so if anything, there's rage from her side and, you know, rage over Nutgate. So you don't get the same impression from him. I'm not saying he didn't feel ang angry about anything, just that he's not the kind of guy who, who acts out on his anger um, in an impulsive way and in a passionate way. He's just not that kind of person. And um, that brings us to another aspect which is quite interesting, something I posted on Shakedown um, in September. Could Thrive Supplements and Patch be the cause of Chris Watts' rage? I don't really like discussions like that because it ends up saying this wasn't Chris's fault, it was, it was a drug that was in his system. If the drug wasn't in his system, he wouldn't have done it. Or... Chris Watts has this disorder. It's got nothing to do with him. It's got nothing to do with the dynamics. He didn't make a choice. He's not responsible. He has this disorder, and, and that's why the crime happened, which is another kind of way of saying, well, if you have this disorder, then you, Chris Watts, you, you, you're going to do exactly the same thing. And it's not, it's just not so. And by giving people disorders, you tend to demonize them. And, you know, I can tell you when people get along, it's everything's fine. As soon as people disagree with one another, then the person you disagree with will suddenly have a disorder. They suddenly are minimized by some aspect to them that, that, that is caricatured in a disorder, right? Um, and that's why it's not a very accurate way of thinking about crime in labels or disorders or... Um, or someone just snapping. It's usually a bit more complicated than that. So I don't give very much um, substance to the rage um, aspect in terms of the darkness. I think there was um, a level of anger and resentment, but one must also be clear and say, if you look at, say, the Patrick Frazee case, where um, Frazee smashed his fiance's body to death. He bludgeoned his fiance to death with a baseball bat, creating a massive blood spray across the whole lounge, a bloodbath. That is rage. That is frustration. That, that is um, that's someone out of control. Um, even though I think he was also in control in, in a certain way. I mean, it was also premeditated crime. But that is... That is more explicit rage. And often where there's a lot of emotion, there is a lot of bloodshed, there's a lot of um, the crime scene is chaotic and messy. This one wasn't. This one was very neat. And so we move on to evil. Um, it's a word that even CBI agent Tammy Lee uh, mentioned. Um, 
she said something that a lot of other people have repeated that you know because the second version is more horrible it's got to be true um, if you take that full quote to the end of it she sort of says you know a lot of people ask me do you believe him do you believe that final version was the truth and I have to say yes because it was more horrible than I, I have I had ever let my mind go to this was a complete act of evil by Chris Watts um, there's a, a danger in thinking that way because you simply dismiss things that you don't understand or you don't have an explanation for by simply calling it evil you say well what happened here is 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 kind of incomprehensible so so i'm just going to call it evil and and wash my hands and, and walk away and i don't think that's the case here i don't think um i don't think the ver this final version is the truth and I think one of the reasons why it's become the truth is because people don't want to think any further because it's so horrible that they don't want to let their minds go there but but if you want to be a true crime rocket scientist if you want to you know um decipher true crime in a genuine way then you've got to let your mind go into the darkness and you've got to make you've got to find out what's going on there and so calling it evil is just kind of a, a cop-out. Calling something evil in true crime is a little bit like asking a weatherman, um, you know, for a weather report and them telling you, well, one thing you can expect to see is daylight. So, so you kind of say, okay, I want to, can, can you give me some detail about what weather to expect tomorrow? And they say, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some information. There's going to be daylight tomorrow. That is what is, that, that's what calling a, um, a crime evil, that, that's how helpful that is. I mean, it's so laughably self-explanatory. It's like saying... Committing a murder is is bad. Committing a murder isn't a good thing. It's it's a bad thing, and it's like yes, obviously, obviously it's not a good thing. It's not it's not a it's not a good thing. So it's an evil thing. Yeah. So obviously it's an evil. So to sort of explain the um, darkness in Chris Watts by saying well it's evil. It's just a non-explanation. It's a absolutely non-explanation. It's a cop-out. It's basically saying, I don't know. You might as well just say, I don't know. So if you ask the weatherman, do you have some kind of idea what the weather's going to be like tomorrow? And he says, well, you can expect daylight. You, you might as well interrupt him and say, listen, yeah, you don't know, do you? You don't know what it's going to be. And if he says, no, there'll be daylight. And you say, but what I want to know is, is it going to be hot or cold? Is it going to rain? Is, is the wind going to blow? What kind of daylight is, it, is there going to be? Is, is, is there going to be, you know, clouds or whatever? And, and that's kind of, if you're going to talk about evil, that's just um, the absolute um, kindergarten level of thinking about something. It's just not... Uh, helpful at all and although it doesn't come up often it, it does come up a few times in the discovery Chris Watts refers to the evil that he witnessed when Shanann was on top of CC and you can tell that that's fictitious in itself you know he says when Shanann was on top of CC strangling her um, he witnessed evil but I don't think he did. I think he's lying. And, and I think him saying that, it's easy to buy that in, in such kind of symbolic tones. But there's no real description there because it didn't really happen. And then Chris said he also felt evil for what he did to Shanann. That's also not telling us what he felt or why. It's just kind of a bland reference. 
And it's not surprising that Coder wasn't satisfied with his, with this explanation, this non-explanation. And so he asked Chris Watts again, you know, what did he witness in CC's room? You know, he wanted details. He wanted the weather report. And that's what we must insist on as well. Prior to the first confession, when the day before, when he was still giving his sort of spiel to Coder, it was just him and Coda one on one. This was on, I think it was Wednesday, uh, Tuesday night. Um, the confession was on Wednesday afternoon and evening. But on Tuesday night, um, he kind of said the following to Agent Coda. He said, I don't know what your opinion is, but you have to realize that these two beautiful girls right here and my wife, I had nothing to do with the disappearance. Like they've managed, they were taken. Someone has taken, they saved somewhere. We don't know. I had nothing to do with the, with this, with this act like evil cruelty, whatever has happened here. Because my love for these girls and my wife, like I don't want anything to happen to them. I never want anything to happen to them. And it goes on to say, I never wish harm on anybody or a, on a human being in general. But what's interesting is he refers to what may have happened to them as an act of evil cruelty, right? So that's just another reference in the discovery. There are not many, by the way. And then interestingly, there are quite a few from Shanann. She talks about the evil of the world. Um, she talks about protecting her children from evil family, referring to Chris Watts' family. And then she refers to she's evil, referring to Chris Watts' mother. So in the space of this, um, some, it's a kind of a rant. Um, while they were in North Carolina, she uses the word evil three times, all to do with Chris Watts' family. And one must ask, can you compare the two? Can you say um, when you have a disagreement with your mother-in-law, that's evil. You know, your mother-in-law is evil. When someone commits triple murder, that's also evil. Or, or the, is that kind of evil interchangeable? You might say it is. But what I would say is um, it's the difference between saying um, that's, you know, if you say your mother-in-law is evil, it's like saying, well, the weather is daylight. And when someone commits murder, it's saying, well, it is, and you give the exact degrees. You say, okay, well, it's really, really hot out there. You know, that's basically the weather. It's just really, really hot. It's quite a big difference between knowing it's daylight and, and the, the kind of daylight it is. So just calling someone evil who may be treated, didn't you treat you well or whatever it is, and someone who actually commits a murder, there's a big difference. There's a big difference in criminal acts and everything else. A very, very big difference. But I also wouldn't go as far to say that... Um, Criminal acts are evil, and, and all other acts aren't evil. It's just too simplistic. Um, evil exists in the world, and evil exists in people who aren't criminals. Evil doesn't only exist in a criminal. And I don't think you can say that at the moment that a person commits a crime, they become evil. I think that evil was there all along. So this concept of evil isn't very helpful. We need something else to to help us along and so when wral.com interviewed a former detective he talked about chris watts exercising the evil within him i don't know what that means i don't know if he know he knows what that means but he did say that this was a very unique case and it is the chris watts case is a very unique case but dismissing it as evil or trying to label it as evil just doesn't tell you anything. And there have been other headlines as well, such as um, from Cafe Mom, which talks about 
um, Shanann slamming Chris's evil parents, um, and then also the whole demonic thing. This takes that whole evil thing into a more specific area where um, Sherilyn Cadle basically took Chris Watts' own words and also gave her own kind of assessment um, that he was demonic but not possessed by a demon. And kind of interesting then for me, kind of laughably, in the Dr. Oz show, you kind of have this non-medical assessment about demon possession and you've got a medical expert there um, who, who knows a little bit about the human body and the human mind and, and he doesn't really express his opinion one way or the other. Um, one of his experts says, confirms he is demonic. There's no question about that. Oh, so, so Chris Watts is demonic. Um, but the idea that a demon possessed him in a temporary way and that he's now free of that and filled with the Spirit of God is really unbelievable. And the reason for that is that he doesn't seem to be remorseful. Um, I agree with that, that he isn't truly remorseful. You know, if he showed true remorse, he would be honest. And he would be... Um, there would be a lot of grief and contrition and gritting of teeth and just being devastated. I don't think he is he, truly sorry for what he did. Um, I, I don't think it, it's truly remorseful, which also puts into perspective this idea of being demon possessed, because if he's not truly remorseful, then the demon's still in him, isn't it? And that brings us to another um, another aspect, which is lust. Some people might call it the demon of lust. Um, and I think compared to the aspects we've dealt with so far, rage and evil, I think this one has a little bit more substance. I think this one has far more substance than lust, sorry, than um, rage. And I think... Um, Evil just is simply uh, an empty word that doesn't really say anything. So with with lust, we're getting somewhere in terms of the darkness inside Chris Watts. He himself, in this letter that he wrote, this love letter that he wrote to Nicole Kessinger, said, you know, I was addicted. I was addicted to you. And we may not take that literally, but we should take it literally. What happens when you're addicted to someone? Your thinking changes. Your choices change. Your your choices may also not be very clever. Your you you become desperate in certain ways. You become triggered in certain ways. You become there's, there are different things driving your body and your mind. And there's another message that he actually sent to Nicole Kessinger. In early August, where he, he says to her, being in your life is something I crave. And I think that was definitely true. I think that it's exactly how I felt. And I think you've got to think about that. You've got to think when you have those feelings of, I don't think it's just sexual craving. I think it's also a kind of existential yearning. You want to be with someone. You also want to be with them physically, but you also want to be with them um, emotionally and you also want to be with them um, for that feel good feeling you know the, the ego aspect but also the that sense of well-being that sense of reinforcement that you get from someone and I think a lot of people especially women seem to dismiss Chris Watts's feelings towards his mistress as just shallow empty um, sexual craving and they, they say, well, I don't, I don't think, and, and I think Lena de Harley is one of them, thinking that he doesn't know how to love, he, he doesn't have much experience with love, he doesn't um, know what it is, that's why I had to Google it. Um, he, um, what he felt wasn't love, it was, it was some kind of shallow, visceral, physical feeling. I don't think that's true. I, I don't think you would commit triple murder 
um, for a shallow feeling. Um, I'm sure it has happened in the past. I don't think that's what's happened here. Chris Watts is is a introverted person. He's a is a person who thinks a lot, and I don't. And he had a long time to think about it. So I, I really don't think this was about just about sex. I think you know if you want to spend your life with someone, if you want to you know make a life with someone and live happily ever after with someone, you want to leave your home. You know that's not just about sex. That's about a fairy tale, far more than just about a physical sensation. And it's kind of, for me, for me, quite shocking that, that um, so many women are so dismissive to say, well, now I don't think there's actually any real uh, feeling here. And, and I think the reason is because if you dismiss Watts as evil, if you dismiss him as someone who just snapped, then you're also going to say, well, he... Um, is incapable of love. And I've got a counter to that, which is, didn't Chris Watts love his father? Like, wasn't there kind of a mutual respect and sense of genuine love and affection between father and son? A sense of trust, a sense of loyalty, a sense of friendship, a sense of kinship. And you might say no, and you might say you don't care, but if there was, then Chris Watts is capable of real love. And um, his wife, at the time that she was killed, wanted to stay married to him. She'd been married to him for eight years, and she wanted to stay married to him. She didn't want him to leave her. She was asking him to stay in the marriage, which seems to be a sign that she loved him and sh and. and didn't believe that he didn't love her anymore. And she said this to him, you know, how can you fall out of love with someone in six weeks? So as far as she was concerned, he still loved her. So, so which is it? Was everybody sort of wrong about Chris? Or was he actually capable of loving other people? And this is the part where I think people miss it, is that they kind of say, either he loved his family and then he snapped or something, or he didn't love them and he's incapable of love and what he did, only a monster would do. And people don't seem capable of, of putting the two together to say, and, and that is what is truly horrifying and terrifying about this case is that someone could love his children, could love his wife, could um, be loved also, and then do what he did to them. And it didn't just ha happen overnight. It wasn't that he loved them and then murdered them. It was he loved them and then his feeling shifted and he loved, his, he loved someone else. And I don't think you can come back afterwards and say, well, he never loved his wife to begin with. Or he never loved his children to begin with. I think he did. I think they loved him. He loved them. But feelings change. And I think when the, the, the murderous impulse came about in the beginning, I think he felt conflicted. I think he felt awkward. But he nevertheless um, resolved to do what he was going to do. Um an absolutely despicable resolution, but he made peace with it. He decided, I don't want to do this, but I don't have any choice. I'm desperate. I have to do this. But we still don't have an explanation for why. Part of that explanation is that he was addicted, that he craved Nicole Kessinger, and he didn't want anything in his way. But that, that's not enough of an explanation. It's not telling you why he didn't just get a divorce. I mean, if he got a divorce, he could still have indulged in his feelings. I mean, that was what Kissinger wanted. Kissinger wanted him to get a divorce. Kissinger wanted him to get a separation. And that's just something to quickly touch on. Um, there are people who persist in the belief that Kissinger was some party or accessory to the murder. Why was she then asking him about a separation? Why wouldn't she be asking him about when can we murder your family? You know, there's a bit of a schizophrenia there. You know, you're looking at shadows on the driveway all the time, looking at the shapes of jeans and shoes. 
why don't you look at anything else? Why don't you go and look at the discovery and look at what she was talking about all the time? Look at her texts. Look at his texts. Look at what she says in the interrogation. Maybe you don't believe all of it, but surely if someone is talking about getting separated, then, you know, and, and there are texts about it, then, then surely, um, Anyway, that's something that's something separate. But what's interesting as well is you seem to get that same addiction and lust from Kessinger, and one could say that she she um, she maybe sort of addled his mind a little bit because even when he was in North Carolina, so this was a, a moment to to break that addiction, to break that hold that 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 she had over him because he's now away from her for a week but we know that she sent quite a few photos of herself and and that did the opposite that kept him under her spell and so i think that that was a factor there was lust there was this um this this sort of visceral attraction to someone else And what's interesting is that's not the only sort of reference to addiction that we have. We know that Chris Watts' father also suffered from addiction. He had, a, I think, a cocaine addiction for a while. And so what that shows is a capacity, at least, with the Watts men to become, um, to kind of get themselves in over their heads in, in certain situations where they are somewhat losing control. So they're quite reserved guys. They're quite cool, calm, and collected, but they can also... Um, they can also lose their cool under certain circumstances, if that makes sense. Okay, so I think so far... I, I don't know if you're with me on this, but I think... Lust is, is a far stronger contender for the darkness inside of him, right? And that then brings us to the next one, which is fear. Now, I've asked this um, quite a few times on Crime Rocket. I've done a couple of polls, and um, typically this is uh, not something people talk about. So I've, I've said, you know, do you think fear was a factor in this crime? And no one said, no one seems to think that, or very few do, or very few did. Um, they don't think fear was a really big driver. People like the idea of rage. You know, the rage just makes sense. Um, and I've always felt from the beginning that that fear was the driving force, not only of Chris Watts in a major, major way, but also Shanann and, and also even of the children. The whole nutgate thing is all about fear. The whole debt burden, this, this, this cratering of their finances under their enormous home is um, terrifying. It's this kind of gnawing monster that just won't go away. It's this shadow that, that sort of looms over them. And people are so sort of entertained and um, spellbound by Shanann's Thrive videos that, that they just don't see the fear. And that is the sort of two faces to the story, is you have the picture postcard face with all the happy smiles and, and, the, and the thriving. Meanwhile, when you turn the camera off and you look behind closed doors, there's a lot of fear going on. What 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 is the fear? Well, it's the fear of abandonment. It's the fear of possibly abortion. It's the fear of poor health. Um, it's the fear of death in a way. You know, there was the fear of Cece dying prior to her actual death. Bella was caught up in that same fear herself. So it's. There was a very real fear, and there was a fear with Shanann that her husband was going to leave her, and he did intend to leave her. Chris Watts also had a fear, and this is perhaps the most misunderstood fear of all. He was afraid of what Shanann would do if she found out what he was doing. And as I say, most people just don't 
think that far because they think, so what? So what if Shanann reacted badly? Well, you're not Chris Watts in this case, and you've got to put your feet in his shoes to know what is going on and to know what his darkness is. And most people just don't do that. Why don't they do that? Because they say, well, he's an evil monster and we know what happened. He just snapped. And as I said, that is the very shallow version. The actual version is that he felt tremendous fear for what was going to happen and that he was going to lose what he thought he had. He's going to actually lose everything. And so if we go to the discovery, we see countless references to fear. And it's not just the word fear, it's also the word being afraid of something or scared of something comes up again and again and again, far more than rage or anger. And one of, one of the interesting references is from Chris Watts' father, Ronnie, where um, he says, if, if Shanann's gone, do you think we could FaceTime with the girls tonight? And this was the, the very last day that the family was still alive. This was at <clears throat> 14.33 on August 12th. And so even the words are quite um, portentous, just the way that Ronnie says, you know, if Shanann's gone, do you think we could FaceTime with the girls? And of course, at that time, Shanann was still alive. She, she had, had just hours left to live. And the children also had hours left to live. And Ronnie asked his son, you know, do you think it would be a good idea if we, if, if I talk to, to my grandchildren? And Chris Watts answers, well, that he is afraid. So Ronnie wants to talk to his children, his, his grandchildren, and what's his response is he's afraid to do that. He's afraid that Bella will tell Shanann. He's afraid that Bella will um, get him into trouble, which is a really fascinating dynamic. I mean, you can imagine if um, the crimes didn't happen and Chris Watts continued his affair, wouldn't the children tell their mother that, Maybe their father was seeing someone. Couldn't that happen at some point down the road if he didn't tell her? And that may have played into his thinking. Um, you know, that they were so attached to their mother, um, they wouldn't be able to handle the situation. In any event, Ronnie responded, that's what I'm afraid of. He, he said that he would... Um, he was he was afraid that if Shanann found out that he'd simply spoken to his grandchildren, Shanann would have a fit. Those are his words. That she would just kind of have a fit of rage because of that. And Shanann's rage even made Chris Watts' father scared. And I think this is an aspect of the Chris Watts case that's not spoken about a lot. I think when you do talk about it, um, people accuse you of being all sorts of things. I'm just talking, I'm just referring here to what's in the discovery. I'm not trying to manufacture anything. I'm not trying to create rumors or create hatred or blame anyone. I'm simply saying that this is what the discovery is showing. And it's also the reason why people don't understand this case. And, you know, when the when people talk about, you know, Lifetime should have gone to the Rusiks and gotten their sort of opinion on this case, I really don't know if they would be giving them information that would really be helpful. I think they would be saying what a wonderful person Shanann was, and I'm sure she was. But I don't think they're going to be providing both sides to that coin. You know, in a situation where somebody dies something not good was going on. Are you willing to talk about that stuff? Are you willing to talk about the not good stuff? And probably the answer is no, or, or not so much. 
and that's understandable because you love your child and you want to remember the best things but true crime is about the full view of what has happened how did the people feel and, and yeah you see the sense of um, feeling afraid of someone else and afraid of their becoming angry it's quite simple I think it happens in a lot of families but the operative emotion here is fear and there's a lot of fear if you go to the, the um, discovery and this is just a very simple example of it is Coda says to what um, you know if there was an accident if there's something you're afraid of telling me it's okay and that's something that is very common with people um, knowing something knowing how you feel about something but being afraid to say it beca because you're afraid if you say it something is going to happen someone's going to react a certain way and it may be devastating and it so often does happen so often that instinct of don't say what you feel don't be honest about it because if you are you're going to be punished there's going to be devastating consequences because some people do have vicious tempers vicious personalities spiteful um, ways of responding and so your fear is absolutely legitimate your fear is justified and, and, and in this situation Chris Watts is being asked you know don't be afraid to tell me what happened you know and Chris Watts is afraid and he, he's got every reason to be afraid because if he does tell the agent what happened he's going to spend the rest of his life in jail and that's exactly what happened so his, his fear within the situation was totally rational and totally justified but often we feel a lot of fear and anxiety in our lives and I actually read a quote uh, quite recently I think it was someone who liked a quote that I posted onto Instagram which is that the ability to overcome anxiety is heroic so if we can just overcome our anxiety that in itself is heroic just because there is so much anxiety there's a lot of very justifiable anxiety you know of course Chris Watts overcoming his anxiety and telling the agents what had happened even though he lied about it wasn't really heroic in a way it was heroic you know it was a moment of honesty but ultimately it exposed him as a villain so um, so one could also think about it like that but just in a general sense overcoming anxiety in a constructive way is definitely heroic instead of being cowed by it and being you know under the thumb of your own fear and anxiety as Chris Watts was Chris Watts was a coward what he did was the work of a coward if he'd been able to control his fear his anxiety things would have turned out better maybe the same could apply to Shanann I know it probably doesn't sound very nice to say that but if Shanann was less fearful as well um, Thrive may have not meant that much to her if her health wasn't so scary as well at one stage I think she even talked about a dark time that she was in her life you know that was that was another aspect of the darkness that was inside Chris Watts may have been attracted to that darkness in the sense that she was vulnerable and she was sort of in a weak place and in that weakness he could come across as strong and kind of be the knight in shining armor and, and she could rely on him and trust him and he could be a strong a pillar of strength right and I think that worked for a while until Shanann came out of her darkness and, and Chris Watts also came out of his shell and, and, and sort of met someone else I think they both came out of their own darknesses and but then they weren't that compatible after that so if we continue on with this afraid and fearfulness um, you even get it from Shanann's friend saying that I think it was Cassie said that um, Shanann was broken and scared that Chris was going to leave her 
So this was Shanann's fear. She was terrified that Chris was going to leave her, and he was going to leave her. He, he did intend to leave her. And she said she was also afraid he was going to take the kids, and we know that she went to see a lawyer, and or she saw a lawyer at a restaurant and spoke about this. So she was genuinely afraid he was going to take the kids, and I think she was going to do everything she could so that he didn't. And maybe he, he knew that he wouldn't be able to take the kids. But um, Shanann was also scared. And, you know, if you again, if you say Chris Watts doesn't know how to love someone or didn't know how to love someone or whatever, he didn't know what love is. Um, Shanann was so attached to him that when it seemed like it was over, she was broken and she was afraid. There's another reference, although this one's not all that appropriate or um, significant. Um, it's a friend of Shanann said that she was scared when Shanann had disappeared. And then you kind of have Chris Watts appearing very suave and very charming and very kind of nonchalant. And but where's his anxiety now? He's pretending not to have any. Uh, if you go to discovery page 58, and this is really the bottom line, is what was Chris Watts really afraid of? I mean, there were maybe he was a bit afraid of Shanann's reactions here and there, but what was he really afraid of? And you see it sort of referenced again and again in the discovery page 58. Um, Shanann told, I think it's, it could be Eddie, I, I'm not 100% sure who this is referring to, but she told one of her friends that Chris didn't want the baby she was pregnant with and that he was scared, and he, he was. He was scared of what the baby would do to his affair. He was scared of what the baby would do to his relationship that meant a lot to him. And this is another thing where that I think a lot of the people thinking Nicole Kessinger was an accessory. Why would Chris Watts be scared about the baby? I mean, if Nicole Kessinger knew about it and people will say, of course she knew about it, she was watching his Facebook. Well, why would Chris Watts say to Shanann, well, you know, I'm, I'm scared about this third child. Why would it even be a factor if Nicole Kessinger knew about it? And it kept, kept coming up. It kept coming up that... that Chris Watts was scared to death about the baby. I thought Nicole Kessinger knew about it all along. So why is Chris Watts scared? Another reference is from Christina Meacham, where she says... Um, Shanann was scared about how Chris Watts was going to respond to the new baby in the household. So at this stage, Chris Watts had already made his feelings clear. He said he didn't want the baby. He was, he was scared. He didn't know what was going on in his mind. And this was starting to frighten Shanann. And, and she said to her friend, I don't know how he's going to respond when I, when I, when I bring this baby into the world. I don't know what's, what he's going to do. She's, she doesn't know who he is anymore, and that's scaring her. And she had reason to be scared because he was having an affair, and he was scared that he was going to lose the, the new love of his life. And Nicole Kessinger was scared that she was going to lose him. She was scared that she was, she was going to be second, and she was scared that when Shanann came back, everything was going to be over. So there's a lot of... Um, fear all round, wasn't there? And if you just look at the words in the discovery, Eddie said that he is scared to death about the third baby. Eddie suggests that Chris is just scared and that it, it will be 
fun once the baby is is born or something like that. Um, Shanann had the ultrasound and the following day said she was scared. So you, you just see the these words coming up again and again. You can think for any adults in the situation, any adults where you have a pregnancy and uncertainty about commitment, it's going to bring in all sorts of anxiety and terrible fear, isn't it? There's another reference where Nicole said to Chris Watts, this was I think on Monday night, that he should move his truck so that Shanann wouldn't be scared to come home. So even Nicole is sort of thinking, is Shanann scared of something? There's another reference to scared where Nicole says she was scared because she didn't know who Chris was anymore. And I think that is one of the most scary things in in all of our lives, in all of our experiences, is when you get to know someone and you get to like someone and then you find out, I don't think I really do know this person. Because of how they treat you or because of how they've lied to you, you realize how either weak you've been or how horrible they are or some kind of combination. You, you kind of feel, you do feel kind of a sense of fear, like, wow, this is just done to me. Or, I don't know, you know, I, w I was going to do this with this person and now I've, I've realized actually who they are. I almost did that. I almost gave that up. I almost committed this or whatever it is. Um, and that 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 brings about um, legitimate feelings of concern, doesn't it? And Chris Watts also says, you know, I didn't know what else to do. I was so scared. It's like my wife just did this, and this is a obviously a fictional situation. We again, he's talking about what Shanann supposedly did, and then he says, "I was so scared." I think he was. I think he was scared, and he did what he did to take control. It's his way of taking control of that fear, and this is where it sort of the, where does all this fear take us? I'm scared. I'm scared. Where does all this fear take us? And where it takes us is where Chris says he was scared of what everything was going to look like. Because that was something um, Coda said, you know, what were you afraid of? Scared of what? And then he said, well, you're scared of what everything was going to look like. He was asked, why did he take the bodies out of the house and bury them? You know, why, why bury them in oil? And Chris said he was scared of what everything was going to look like. And it's a pity... Coda didn't ask him to elaborate on that because Chris Watts more than likely would have said, well, I'm scared of, um, you know, what the bodies in the house were, were going to look like. Yes, I'm sure. He, that's something he couldn't have allowed, is, is um, bodies in his home. How is that going to reflect on him? But if they disappeared, then it was going to look different. But there was also the other aspect. What is everything going to look like if they did get divorced? What is everything going to look like if he came clean to his wife and said, I'm having an affair? What if what happens if there was a Nicole gate? Not a nut gate, a Nicole gate where the world got to hear what Shanann thought about her husband cheating on her while she was pregnant. Chris said he was scared of what everything was going to look like. And this word comes up again and again. He was so scared he didn't know what to do. Scared out of his mind he didn't know what to do. Broken and scared Chris was going to leave her. She was afraid. I don't want to raise eight years just like that. I don't know if it's my parents or the third pregnancy. If I'm just scared. I'm scared, okay, you wanted the truth and I told you how I felt. And this is where 
Shanann says to him, you know, I was trying to get you to expletive hug me, make me feel safe, make me feel like everything's going to be okay. And she's saying, I'm worried, I need to feel reassured. She says, I don't need words, damn it. You just told me you don't want this baby. And he answers, I'm scared, okay? You wanted the truth and I told you how I felt. And I think that's true. He was scared. He is scared in this situation. He's scared of what the baby's going to do. It's going to devastate his relationship with Kissinger. And it did. Chris told me last night he's scared to death about this baby. And he was. He was scared to death about it. And so I think the fear is, is um, perhaps one of the biggest aspects in the darkness inside not just Chris Watts but the whole Watts family, that fear. And I think a big part of that fear was in three areas. I think the fear was based on the terrible money situation. So because of their debt, there was a lot of fear and anxiety that wouldn't otherwise have been there. The affair caused a lot of fear, especially in Chris Watts. You know, it was one thing to have an affair while everyone was away, but as soon as they got back, well, that was going to be a different ball game. That was going to be scary. And then the third aspect was the baby, the, the unborn child. And that was making everyone scared. It was making Shanann scared because she needed her husband then more than ever. It was making her husband scared because he didn't want to be needed. He wanted to be let go of. And indirectly, it was making Nicole Kessinger scared because she's kind of feeling like, am I going to be number one? And this baby was really, uh, which she didn't know about, was really um, testing that question. And, and Chris Watts knew it. Am I going to be number one? And Chris Watts knew, knew that with a baby around, you're going to know you're not number one. And I want you to be number one. I, I need to get rid of this baby. I need to get rid of this family in order to prove that you are number one. That's how he saw it. And so fear is definitely the, the overriding darkness inside Chris Watts. And there are a couple of factors that play into it. But as important as the lust and the fear is, it's still not really telling us what this darkness is and where it comes from. And it's something that we all share. I think some of you have felt that same sense of fear and anxiety just in general in your own lives when you talk about it. Just that there's anxiety in all of us. And it's in this sense that we can identify not just with um, Shanann and even the children who also were fearful and there's also the, the health side the health aspects to deal with and then I think we can also identify somewhat with Chris Watts when I say identify I don't mean sympathize or feel sorry for him I mean understand what was going on in these people and also understand that some of the same things are going on inside of us and that is what is truly scary, is that we are also capable of being pushed by our own fears and anxieties into dangerous places. And that's why we must be very conscious of our fears and anxieties and we must understand them. We mustn't take shortcuts and turn these rich but tragic events into um simple and silly little arguments about evil and narcissism. It's, it's much more complicated than that and it's also much more simple. It's a much richer thing going on. It's a much more fully fledged thing going on. But it's also not necessarily rocket science. It's kind of a basic psychology. And that's what brings us to what I think is the explanation for this darkness that is beyond narcissism and beyond um, evil 
and it's what I call the live character. And from a distance, you could see it. From a distance, you could see this picture postcard family. You could see the nice smiles, the happy faces, the, the well-dressed role players um, doing their, their thing for, for, for the Thrive promotions. You could see it from a mile away. You could see this perfect family. And, and what is all of that? What is that whole spiel? It's, it's a lie. It's the lie of character. You have it on the level of the multi-level marketing, but you also have it on the level of the individual characters in these spiels that are not what you're seeing isn't quite what is going on. And you, you might say that's not very nice to say, but what ultimately happened with the Watts family? This family was destroyed from, from the inside. And if everyone had been more honest with one another, it may not have happened. If everyone had been more honest with themselves, it may not have happened. If everyone had been more honest, maybe even on social media, it may not have happened. And when I say something like that, I, I, I mean including Chris Watts to Nicole Kessinger. If Chris Watts had said, listen, here, my wife's pregnant. Just that, I think, would have saved three lives. Maybe he would have lost Nicole Kessinger, but that little moment of truth would have dispelled a lot of darkness. It would maybe have plunged him back into a loveless marriage for him or something, but um, that's what the story needed in order for it not to end as, as horribly as it did. I'm not going to talk to you a lot about the live character because it's a, it, it is a fairly complicated um, thing. But the live character is about the renderings we, all of us do. We don't, you don't need to be a criminal to do this. But it's how you turn your life into a lie. And everybody has the live character. Some of us just work much harder at it. Um, social media is about the live character. Narcissism plays into the, the live character as well. But character is something that we construct for ourselves in order to tell society, this is who I am. And sometimes it's where we say, society says this is who I am, and yes, that's true. So sometimes the live character acknowledges the lie of culture, saying this is your role in society and, 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 and you're a good citizen because you are doing your role as, as required. You, your, your job in this life is to be a mother and that's it. Okay, here I am. I'm a mother. I'm a good mother and there you go. Character is something that we invent for ourselves. We, we say this is, the, this is the person I am to the world. And, um, but it's a lie. And I will put a clip in the, or a link to a clip that talks a little bit about the live character. I talk quite a lot about it in on Patreon. Um, there's a particular particular episode about it. So if you're interested, you can go and look at that. And it's also in my books. But um, uh, I'm not going to talk about it a lot here, except to say that the fear plays also into the live character. And um, so when you watch the Lifetime movie, think about that. Think about these concepts that we've spoken about. And think about the live character and how they can start to tear people apart from one another. The live character is fine until you can't be honest about who you really are, what you really want, and what that's going to look like. And whether society is going to accept that, whether society will embrace you as who as who you really are is society going to accept you when you tell them exactly who you are or you're going to need to hold something back you're going to need to keep a couple of secrets are there certain things you, you're going to need to hold back and and under those conditions society will accept you that's the law of character hope you found this episode um interesting 
Uh, if you have, please uh, subscribe to the channel, like, share, leave a comment, and I'll see you guys next time.